Okay, time for an update on this project. So this was about to do its final endurance test when I found out my fuse is blown. And the reason for that is I've actually blown these uh, tra um, inverters up quite a few times already, probably five times or so now. And mostly I have to uh, replace the uh, MOSFETs, uh, but on top of that, often these diodes will go as well, and sometimes these will go, and if if the diode's gone and these are gone, chances are this thing needs to be replaced as well. Uh, the last time this happened was on this particular unit. This particular unit's only blown up once, and there's, I think, is a design issue. Um, I was trying to tune in the short circuit current uh, cutoff. So there's two uh, circuits here, these two um, potentiometers. There's two more over there you can't really see because of the shadow. They're just that higher voltage and low voltage to monitor the DC side, um, and that's easy to, enough to adjust with the power supply. Uh, this one here, you adjust it so that if you get a short circuit condition, it shuts, it shuts itself off. But yeah, you need to be able to see what direction the pot um, has, the like what kind of change that's making. So it's just simply you put a, a multimeter probe on the output of this op amp. But by doing that, it just sent this thing into some weird oscillation and it kind of shorted itself out. It did it a couple times and nothing happened, so I just kept going and eventually blew up. And I suspect the very high impedance of this op amp, coupled by the very close proximity to this DC to DC converter here, there's a huge inductor right next to it. There's a lot of noise coming off of this and that noise going in on that line, which is normally very low voltages, if it induces uh, even the slightest voltage on the input, it's going to get amplified, and that's the whole point of this thing, right? This uh, controller looks for 0.5 volts uh, to, to shut off from either short circuit current or continuous current cutoff. So what I've done here is just kind of circumvented the short circuit current completely because I do have other redundant uh, safety measures in, in effect. But So that'll be, I'll be relying on this one, and that's fine. This is the, the more important one anyways. It, I want to tune this so that if I ever go uh, over... 280 amps AC. Um, actually, this is monitored to the DC, so I have to I have to do that accordingly. Um, uh, that it'll it'll shut off and stay off and for a period of time. Uh, or actually, what this thing does is, it, according to the data sheet, it shuts off and then resets and tries again. So it, and it'll do that like five times before it stays off. It's not the most ideal situation. Um, that's why it's good to re just rely on something like a circuit breaker. <clears throat> to shut it off if there's a short circuit or an overload uh, situation. Um, so what happened is um, because of uh, this error that's going on uh, with this, um, uh, when I was trying to tune this in, this thing short circuited and it blew up. And in the past, it hasn't really been an issue because you know it burns itself out and, and, stop, and there might be a few sparks or whatever, and, and that's the end of it. And then I, I click that off there. I turn off my emergency switch here and I'll continue on. But this time I didn't realize it. I've, I've got this thing all back together. I did a bench test. It's ready to go. I hook it all up and nothing happens. And it, tur it turns out this fuse probably saved my life because uh, it's a 400 amp fuse. So that means I probably exceeded 400 amps and it blew. This fuse is now toast and um, I have to get another one. So. Uh, that's going to delay things quite a bit because this is not something I can just go pick up at the local hardware store. You need to get a fuse that's rated for DC volts, uh, and that's very important. Uh, so I'm going to go on a tangent a little bit in this video and talk about something else that I've been meaning to talk about, and that is why how important wire thickness is. A lot of people uh, really misunderstand uh, how much wire you really need for high currents like this. Um, when I got this... Uh, this uh, tr in inverter, I got an inductor to go with it, and the inductor they sent me was like it was a pretty sizable inductor. It was pretty big, uh, and they said it was good for 150 amps. But it, it turned out I need something a bit bigger than that. So I built this, and this next segment is going to show exactly how I built that, starting with how I got the, this wire, this uh, copper wire I just recovered from uh, an old transformer, and there's a big lear learning process involved with that. So um, let's get into that. Okay, before I get into talking about uh, the inductor design, let's just find out how thick the wire needs to be first. 
Uh, in order to do that, you need to know how many amps are you dealing with on a continuous or maximum basis, because that's what you got to plan around, right? Um, so the inverter that I have now is rated at 10 kilowatt by the manufacturer. And um, while it's not really clearly published on his uh, description page, it's meant for at 10 kilowatt at 48 volts nominal, which is essentially 50 volts uh, with a lead acid battery, which is what it's designed for. So um, that we need to know how many amps that is. And remember, this is all DC. So that works out to be 200 amps because it's just uh, 50 divided by an into 10,000. But that's on the DC side. So what does that mean for AC? Well, if this thing was working at, at nominal uh, peak um, uh, numbers, then it's just the root mean square of, of this, which is, happens to be 0 0.707 or square root of 2, uh, which gives you 35.35 volts RMS. So that voltage at 10,000 kilowatts, or sorry, 10,000 watts, would give you 282 amps. So this is our maximum AC amps that this thing can output. Cannot go over that uh, without burning something. Uh, if you have some super cooling going on, you might be able to do better, but uh, just that's the number that I'm working with. So that's the number I got to plan for, for the inductor, because that's on the AC side where it's doing that. And just as a side note, my transformer is actually at 24 volts RMS, so it can't do 35. Uh, so what's going to happen is that I need to derate it. So at 24 volts RMS uh, times 282 amps gives me about 6.789 kilowatts, uh, which is a lot less than 10,000 watts, and it's even less than what the transformer is rated for at 7,500 watts. But you know what? This is the best I can do uh, with what I got right here. So uh, moving on, now that I know that this number is 282, I'm going to be using this tool here, uh, and I'll be linking this in the description below. Uh, this chart is for chassis wiring. Um, anyone in North America who's familiar with the electrical code might say that these numbers don't really match. That's because this is not for house wiring. This is for chassis wiring. For example, uh, 14 gauge. Uh, American wire gauge is generally what I'll be referring to, but they also have uh, diameter in uh, millimeters and a uh, cross section in square millimeters, which I know that's popular in Europe and Asia. Anyways, an example is 14 gauge wiring is generally used on a 15 amp circuit breaker um, in residential wiring. Uh, so it's 15 amp circuit breaker, you can't exceed a continuous load of 80% of that or 12 amps. But this thing says it can do 32 amps. Uh, which is significantly more and the reason for that is just you're limited by how hot are you going to allow that wire to get when it's under that uh, condition and because of people's uh, terror of electricity in their homes and insurance and liability and all this bureaucracy nonsense they need to have lots of safety involved uh, and and not have that wire get hot at all plus all the insulation on it and everything so th that's a completely different number however it is permitted by the electrical code for uh, wiring if the insulation is rated properly. And that's a completely separate page. It's a little unrelated. But it just so happens that I, I found it was very odd when I got that transformer, it had 14 gauge wires on the output. Um, but if it's outputting 240 volts, it can only do about 32 amps, actually. It can't really exceed that unless you on a, on a continuous basis. So that actually lines up really nicely. Um, uh, so that means that that transformer is built properly uh, and it's only because the insulation rating on the wire it says clearly on it it's some really hot number and that in the plate on that transformer also said the transformer itself will get very hot but it won't set on fire uh, when running at its maximum power which is just fine if I'm running it below the power this uh, page is important um, you'd be using this a lot so the, actually we, there is a number here that's close to the number I calculated at 283 amps I'm not sure how well that's going to show up on screen uh, and so that means I need a cross-sectional diameter of 67.4 millimeters squared of copper, uh, which just so happens if I have an abundance of 16 gauge um, uh, annealed copper wire, sorry, not annealed, uh, that's stuff that's used on magnet wire, uh, which is down here, uh, 16 gauge, which is 1.31, look at the calculator, And it's, uh, it turns out, if I divide the two, I need, that means I need 51 strands of wire to get it to uh, that, that there. And that's exactly what I did. So, 
So this is the inductor that was uh, supplied uh, by the supplier on AliExpress. Um, I'm not an expert in inductor design and I don't quite understand uh, how it is, but this is a whole learning process and I got to learn a few things. So uh, I was totally stuck. I had no idea what to, how to do. I recovered some uh, wire from a toroid transformer thinking as actually after the core to make a bigger inductor. This totally didn't work because I don't understand um, what's involved in uh, inductor design. You need to know what something is called uh, relative permeability. And I'll just get back on the computer screen uh, in a second here. But the main thing is just while I'm here, I'm going to say that um, you can rotate these cores around a little bit inside. I was able to get the part numbers on there, which allowed me to look it up, which is a huge save uh, to allow me to understand how this works. So uh, this video here by Applied Science uh, talks about um, uh, the BH curve and things like that and talks about how to understand relative permeability and how that works. Um, but uh, just skipping ahead a little bit, um, this website here, I'll link all this in the description, basically how it tells you how to make a toroid inductor. Uh, and it really validated the, the whole uh, design that, of that inductor that uh, it, the, the inverter came with. I'm looking for 47 microhenries and uh, about eight turns. So what, um, what kind of relative permeability would that give me? Well, I didn't have to work out too hard because I was able to look at the part number. And so what I ended up doing is I searched AliExpress and found the cheapest um, send dust. And that's the type of material that original inductor is made out of. It's, it's perfect for this application. Uh, and I needed a, essentially the biggest one I could find. Uh, on, that's not hundreds of dollars because often um, these things, it's just, there's such a specific application, they tend to overcharge, especially for big stuff like this. This is a big one. I got four of them so you can stack them. And the dimensions are on here and everything. It's uh, pretty legit. So this guy, definitely a thumbs up uh, for inductor cores. And I've already loaded the numbers onto this web page that uh, I want 47 microhenries. Uh, and I put the diameter uh, inner and outer of the of the ring. The height of the ring is just multiplied by four because there's going to be four of them. And I already know the relative permeability is 125. Now this number doesn't actually do anything. It just pops up to say if it'll, if it'll fit or not the number of terms. If I put 50 square millimeters, uh, I'll just get a pop up of the screen saying it doesn't fit in the core. You can it doesn't really matter. You can you put anything in here. It's not going to affect the number of turns required. Um, and it's just you'll kind of have to figure out how to make it fit, uh, which I did. So, and you can see down here, if I just change that back to like a, a smaller number and then hit calculate, I'll uh, have it requires 8.1 turns and about 1.36 meters of wire. Now, of course, this is the minimum. If you're going to wind your own ductor, you got to have some extra, so you may get some stems. Uh, and without further ado, let's wind an inductor. Try to be quick. Sorry about that noise. I couldn't really record anything over it. I'm just doing everything on my cell phone. Uh, to wind this inductor, I just I got some acrylic and drilled some holes to act as a comb uh, to keep everything straight. I had to do that about five times and about 12 wires per comb. Uh, it, and it decreased each time. It was getting pretty tight by the end, but I uh, got it to work and it was a great learning experience. And uh, yeah, I've tested this inductor since then and it works pretty good. So uh, thanks.